Hello everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com back again and you know what time it is. You know what time it is. It's my favourite time of the week and this is a very, very jam-packed edition of Wrestlers of the Week. Why? Well, we've had All In, obviously the biggest independent show maybe ever. We've had uh, NXT, Raw, Smackdown. We've had the Mae Young Classic, the first week of episodes has gone out now. Uh, what else have we had? We had Progress's big, um, big Chapter 75 show with a lot of Wembley ramifications went up on Monday, I believe. Or well, sometime in the week anyway, and I've watched it, so don't worry. I'm going to be taking those matches into account. And yeah, it's just been generally all kicking off, apart from in New Japan, where they're taking a little bit of a break. Because they've had a big year, bless them. And they're going to be right back on it, I think even today or tomorrow maybe, as we begin the road to the next set of shows. I want to say destruction. Road to destruction. I believe. But without further ado, let's just get straight into all of the honourable mentions. There's a lot to get through here, so I'm going to forgive me for reading it off the sheet. So we start off with a couple of the best performers from the Mae Young Classic. Because it was such a jam-packed week, unfortunately, I haven't included any of the Mae Young Classic competitors yet in the actual wrestlers of the week, which is a massive shame because there were a lot of impressive folk on the show. Maiko Satomura did really well in the main event, she was awesome. Tegan Knox, of course, really got the crowd behind her, was a massive babyface in the opening match. Rhea Ripley was a great heel, looks like she could be fulfilling the Shayna Baszler role this year. On to NXT now, uh, Velveteen Dream was very impressive, I love him as like a smarmy heel, getting under the skin of Jonathan Gargano. Uh, Flip Gordon, one of the biggest pops of all in, didn't really like actually wrestled too much in the Battle Royal, but his reveal was one of the biggest pops of the night, and then took part in a match against Jay Lethal, which was quite good, but not, not a patch on like the rest of the stuff on the show, let's be honest. Also, big shout out to Tessa Blanchard and Chelsea Green, the two big standout performers from the four-way women's match at All In. Uh, Hideo Itami went back to Japan and wrestled against Naomichi Marafuji in a match that I watched and didn't really, it didn't click with me too much. It was a long, epic match, like over half an hour long, but I didn't really get as invested as I do usually with big, epic matches like that. But still, it was nice to see Atami back in his old promotion. Kagetsu from uh, Stardom continues to impress in their five-star GP. Uh, Joey Janela almost died at All In, so he would have made the list most other weeks. Tyler Bate and Mark Haskins also had a really good number one contenders match in progress, which Tyler Bate won, which means he progresses to Wembley to face Volta for the Progress Championship. And everybody just relax. Now on to my top 10 proper. It's time to start with a man who I think was one of the more underappreciated performers of All In because he fulfilled a very difficult and a very under underrated and underappreciated role. It's Nick Aldis. Every hero needs a villain, and sometimes when you're the hero and you're really cool and destiny's on your side and literally everybody in the world of wrestling wants you to win, it's hard to be a villain to that guy. You know, you, you just need to kind of play it simple. You kind of don't want to get anyone to like you really at all. You can't be a cool heel. You've got to be just a detestable one. And I think Nick Aldis did a really good job of this at All In. The best thing Aldis did here was just ramp up the old school, simple, heelish, I was going to say charm, but whatever the opposite of charm is, the anti-charm. He just ramped up the heelish antics, not in terms of jawing at the crowd, bending the rules too much. It was more just a case of old school, grinding down Cody, really trying to spoil the party and keep the NWA World Heavyweight Championship around his waist. I thought he did a pretty damn decent job, did Nick Aldis. And I really do appreciate as well his role in taking the title from the you know, the dark ages almost, where we didn't really know where the NWA Championship was without Googling it. He's kind of brought it back into prominence, and now it can go off and spread its wings and leave him behind, like, but he's done a good job. <laughs> he's done a good job anyway. Next up, number nine, Johnny Gargano. I thought I had my top 10 list pretty set, but I still watched NXT and Impact and Lucha Underground, the latter shows of the week, just to try and get all the information I could. And man, Johnny Gargano just did some great stuff on NXT in the main event against Velveteen Dream. Basically, Gargano is one of the best examples of a tweener I've ever seen. Being a tweener is really tricky to pull off. Often we call someone a tweener when really it's just a heel that we all want to cheer because they're really cool. But honestly, I think Gargano is actually a tweener and is actually pulling it off really well. In his match with Velveteen Dream, Gargano really just did get across the whole mental trouble that he's facing right now. He didn't know whether to embrace the dark side and pull off some of Champa's own moves. He went for a draping DDT at one point to the outside off the apron thought against it, got back in the ring, and then Velveteen Dream was taunting him and calling him Johnny Failure, so Gargano pulled down the knee pad, went for the running knee, and he shouldn't have done that because Velveteen Dream popped up, hit the Death Valley driver, and won the match. And as Gargano was leaving, there was a mixed reaction. Not a Roman Reigns mixed reaction where it's kind of like a That was a strange noise, but I think it gets my point across. It wasn't that sort of reaction, it was dueling chance, Johnny wrestling, Johnny Failure, and it just... 
it just makes me really want Johnny to refind himself again. Stop trying to be Champa, stop trying to undo the past and just go for it and be yourself and win that bloody NXT Championship, Johnny, come on. Next up, number eight is Hangman Page or Adam Page as he's sometimes known. Uh, one of the breakout stars of the Bullet Club, I want to say. He had a big feature match at All In, obviously that street fight against Joey Janela, and everything Adam Page did here was perfect. I think he really sold his gradual descent into like homicidal madness throughout the match, especially with Joey Killer on his, uh, on his ring attire and stuff like that, it was really fun. There were a lot of sickening bumps that Janela took, but I think Page did his best to protect, to protect him as much as he could, especially on that final rite of passage from the ladder through the table, which was nasty to watch. And you know what? He also bumped hilarious Seriously, for Penelope Ford's big stunner made her look like a million bucks. And after the match, of course, we all know what happened. Dick Gate, Joey Ryan's Dick Gate, Dick Gate. A lot of cocks came out onto the ramp, and um, Joey Ryan came out back from the dead, beat up Hangman Page, and then the penises actually carried him to the back. Um, and, and somehow, despite that humiliation, he's picking up three points this week on Wrestlers of the Week, which just shows that I think you can come back from anything. Next up, number seven, someone that I actually know personally, I'm not trying to show off or anything, but number seven is Jimmy Flippin' Havoc, who had one hell of a two out of three falls, no DQ, special guest referee match at Progress. This was the culmination of the biggest rivalry in Progress history, and probably, I'm gonna say it now, one of the biggest rivalries in British wrestling history, Jimmy Havoc versus Will Ospreay. It wasn't the cleanest match ever. It went long. You could argue that it was a little bit too long even. I think it probably went about 40 minutes. I'm not actually sure. I don't know the official match time, but it felt really long. But at the same time, it was high drama indeed, and both men really hurt themselves and each other in the name of telling a good story. Havoc was at his Havoc-y best here. He was stapling things to Osprey's body. He was throwing weapons at him. At one point, an errant weapon hit the special guest referee, Paul Robinson, who then fell to the outside through a table, and everyone was like, oh no, more refs came out. They were getting put through tables left, right, and center. It was absolute carnage. It was chaos. And still, I think, Havoc really justifies his moniker as the king of the deathmatch because even though he's not the cleanest wrestler around, especially in the UK right now where there's so many smooth and slick wrestlers, I still think that he is amazing at, at selling a story, whether he's the babyface or the heel, one of the best heels by the way around, but when he's a babyface as well, really gets the crowd on side and I think he's fully deserving of a spot on Wrestlers of the Week. And we've got a match to look forward to at Wembley as well. Him versus Paul Robinson in a death match or a no DQ match. It's gonna be a death match basically. It's gonna be horrible. It's gonna be absolutely disgusting. Can't wait. Number six, a man who has really started to make an impact throughout the last few months. He's always been great. I've always loved him, especially on Lucha Underground. But really this year, he started to come into his own on a more global stage. And that man is well, Pentagon Junior or Penta L Zero, you know who I mean, the bloke who does that down in Miggity Miggity Mexico. Penta had a really, really good match with Kenny Omega at All In. Many people's match of the night, actually. Um, a lot of people were quick to sing Omega's praises after the match, saying, wow, another stellar performance from Kenny Omega. But honestly, I think Pentagon was pretty damn good, too. He was throwing all of his... Pentagon's got one of the coolest movesets in wrestling. He's not the most high-flying guy around, but he's got moves that really pop the crowd. He loves a sling blade, for example. Loves a big chop. He might have the hardest chops in wrestling right now apart from Volta. Um, he's really good at super kicks and that sort of thing. Just moves the pop the crowd, but at the same time, he also strings them together to make a cohesive and moving sort of sense of action throughout his matches. And I really appreciate that from him. And also, he's just a massive terrifying man with pain on his face. Jesus, he didn't win the match, by the way. Not many people thought he would either against Kenny Omega, but crucially, there were moments when it looked like he could have won. And that's most, that's, that, that, that's important. Don't know, don't know what's going on with my brain today. Number five, just don't, just calm down. It's Will Ospreay, right? Uh, now, <laughs> I can just feel the fury right now. Like, Jack, you always give Will Ospreay points. If you watch the progress match between him and Jimmy Havoc, you'll see why that I always give Ospreay points because he's not just a flippy guy. He's not just a guy who can go there and do a triple somersault and land perfectly on his opponent. He tells stories, man. Will Ospreay tells stories. This match was the culmination of his years-long feud with Jimmy Havoc. It told the story perfectly, which actually started off with Havoc as the heel and Ospreay as the babyface, and now the roles are reversed. Ospreay came out in Joker colors to really sell that. Whether it was deliberate or accidental, I'm not quite certain. And really put himself through a lot. There's a, a clip that you may have seen on Twitter of Havoc and Osprey perched on a balcony. Not a really high one, but still about that tall, off, that high off the ground. Bigger than me. And they're about to do a Canadian Destroyer 
off the balcony through a pair of tables as you do. Uh, but instead, Osprey reverses it into his own version of the Destroyer backwards and lands the pair of them right on the tables. The tables go bang, neither of them break, and both men go flying, and it's horrible, but very entertaining. Now, there's a crucial point in that match which is actually, to be fair, you can't hear it on the official broadcast, but there's fan footage where you can hear Havoc says something to Osprey while they're setting up for it, and Osprey goes, no, no, you can do it. Just trust me, just trust me. And then does it, because Havoc's trusting Osprey to backflip with him and not essentially drop Havoc right on his head and kill him. And Osprey does it. And I just think the fact that he's got the confidence to say, just trust me, and then to do it. And yes, the landing wasn't perfect because the tables didn't break, but both men carried on the match and finished it. It was absolutely astounding. He also healed it up really well throughout the match, really drinking in the booze of the crowd, really trying to suck up, suck up to the referee, Paul Robinson, and it didn't really work, but I just loved this match from start to finish. It was very long, it wasn't a perfect match, but it was, a, it was an enthralling one, lads, enthralling. Next up, a real front runner and a man who could potentially steal wrestler of the year from Will Ospreay, Kenny Omega. His match with Pentagon, as I mentioned, was wonderful. And yes, I did make a point of saying, oh, everyone said that Omega was great, but Pentagon was great too. But I'd like to reiterate that Omega was great. For me, Kenny Omega is the finest wrestler in the world today. He is wonderful. Yes, you can say he over relies on his knees quite a lot, which he did in this match too. He hit a lot of V-triggers, but I love the V-trigger and I think it actually adds to a match. And he doesn't just hit them willy-nilly. He really places them at key portions of the match. So I think, in a way, they actually add to his matches rather than take away from them. Now, obviously, Kenny saw off Pentagon. The title wasn't on the line, the IWGP Heavyweight Championship, but at the same time, there was little doubt that Kenny was going to lose anyway, and he did win, but his next opponent did jump him after the match. The lights went down, everyone thought he was CM Punk, or I certainly did, because the lights were down for a long time. Then when the lights came back up, nothing had changed. Everything was still, Pentagon was still lying prone in the ring, Omega was still stood up, and then Pentagon got up and hit him with a code breaker, and guess what? It wasn't Pentagon at all, it was the devious, devious Christopher Jericho. Basically, Jericho plugged the match on the cruise ship. It's him and the Young Bucks against Kenny, Skull and Cody, I think. I think they're the two trios involved. And I really want to see that match, so I hope that the cruise footage goes out because Chris still hasn't offered us tickets to the uh, the cruise ship itself. I'm sure they just got lost in the post, Chris. If you just want to send them again, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Number three, Kazuchiko Okada. Wow, what a man. Coming off the back of his record-breaking IWGP heavyweight championship reign, lost his mind a bit in the G1, didn't even win his block came up with balloons and started passing into the crowd, didn't really seem to be taking matches too seriously, but we saw a glimpse of the old Okada at All In in a match of the night for me against Marty Skrull. Okada was excellent here as kind of the, neither guy in the match was really the heel, but Okada was the cocky, bigger man, really making a show of the fact that I'm a heavyweight, Skrull's a junior heavyweight, I'm gonna bully him, use my strength, and really embarrass him in front of all of these people. And then crucially, which is the best part of this match, when he was in trouble, Okada bumped and sold properly for Marty Skrull. There was an excellent brain buster at one point, which Okada just sold like he was totally didn't know where he was, had his bell rung, it was awesome. He then got cocky later on when he came back into the match, did the 205 live thing, and then Mai grabbed his fingers and broke them, and it was just excellent. I love this match. Yes, it did apparently overrun by quite a long way, which caused the main event to be cut short, but just in a vacuum on its own, I love this match. I thought it was awesome, and I can't really say too many bad things about the match itself. Number two, the other participant in that match, and a man who I actually debated making wrestler of the week. He hasn't been wrestler of the week yet, but he has accrued quite a few points over the course of 2018. The villain, Marty Skrull. I'll be honest, in the build-up to this match, this was one of my least anticipated matches of the entire All-In card. I thought, ah, oh, Marty Skrull versus Kazuchika Okada. I can see how this is gonna go. I think there's gonna be a lot of showmanship from both men. I don't think they're gonna take it too seriously. And then in the end, I think that Okada's gonna pick up an easy, pretty straightforward victory. That's not what happened at all. Okada did win, but I genuinely thought that Skrull was gonna win on several occasions. This match also contained one of the near falls of the year when Mario Skrull hit his own Rainmaker on Okada. And I honestly, for a split second, thought that he was gonna win the match. And if he had won, if Skrull had pinned Okada, that would have blown New Japan's divisional system wide open. We'd be seeing heavyweights and juniors wrestling each other all the time. That would have probably been for the best for my liking, but I get why more conservative people wouldn't want to see that yet in New Japan, but I would have loved it. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. Okada did pick up the victory, but this is the best My Skull match I've ever seen, I think. I'll put that into context for you. I worked for a wrestling company that booked Marty Skull quite a lot. For about a year, about two years, I worked for that like a year and a half. I saw a lot of Marty Skull matches is what I'm saying. I saw some excellent ones against Will Ospreay. He's got great chemistry with Will Ospreay. He had a really good match this year with Will Ospreay in New Japan. But this match against Okada 
may have been the best Marty Skrull match I've ever seen. And that is saying quite a lot. And number one, I mentioned that I may have made Marty Skrull wrestler of the week this week, but honestly, on balance, when I looked at everything that had happened, I couldn't give it to anyone else, really. It's the new NWA World's Heavyweight Champion and the man behind All In, Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes, or Cody, as we sometimes know him, uh, fulfilled his destiny this week. He won his dad's belt. He won the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship. And not only that, but he did something that I think his dad was also a symbol of back in his day. He provided and was the figurehead of a massive alternative to WWE. Dusty Rhodes was like the NWA guy back in the day. He was the hero that everyone looked up to before even really WWE was the thing that we know it is now. Now that WWE's taken over the world almost, this is almost even more impressive from Cody, the fact that he is now the figurehead of this movement that is a viable alternative to the mainstream wrestling that we know today. It's all in apparently sounded like an amazing, amazing weekend. I've been speaking to Matthew from Botchamania about it, and he said it was like Woodstock for wrestling. It was incredible. It was a festival and a celebration of wrestling. And it was all capped off, even though it wasn't the main event, by Cody defeating Nick Aldis with a nice old school NWA style finish. Apparently one of the finishes his dad used when he won the belt some years ago, uh, where it was like the SummerSlam 92 finish with Bret and Bulldog, where Cody blocked a sunset flip, sat down on it, and won the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. The pop when he won, was astounding. So yes, Cody Rhodes is my wrestler of the week. His first time winning wrestler of the week, but because of his unique position and his high standing and his excellent character work throughout 2018, he's actually quite high up on the list too, higher than you may think. So with that in mind, let's take a look at that lead table. So as we can see, Will Ospreay's extended his lead slightly at the top, but Kenny Omega is closing in on the top two. Zack Sabre Jr. could be in big trouble. Behind him, Kazuchika Okada's left Matt Riddle behind, but Riddle is obviously well placed to pick up some big points if he debuts in NXT soon. Cody Rhodes has jumped way up into 13th, and behind him, Marty Skull is on his tail in 17th, level with Andrade Cien Armas and Ricochet. So that's it for my wrestlers of the week this week. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Jack from Cultaholic.com. If you want to, you can follow me on Twitter at Jack the Jobber, and you can follow all all of us generally at Cultaholic. Check out our Patreon too if you want at patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And never forget, if you haven't already, to hit subscribe and to join us.